So good morning, welcome to Talk Wildlife again on this, which is World Curlew Day. Um, curlews are a call that, you know, everybody relates to sort of the beaches. You, you can't help but hear it if you're at the beaches. Um, but what a lot of people don't realise is just how much curlew are in trouble and their numbers are declining rapidly. Um, and they are in serious, serious trouble. Uh, what we don't want to happen is for them to go the same way as the Eskimo curlew, which is now extinct, was once a, a very numerous bird. And so I'm going to talk today to David Douglas, who's the principal conservation scientist. Is that right? At the RSPB? That's right. Yeah, so I'm going to talk to David and I'm going to talk to him about curlews. I mean, it is curlew day, so we are going to talk just curlews. But um, I think we'll start off by just getting David to give us a little bit background to himself, and then we'll go in and, and talk a bit more about the project he's involved with. Good, good morning, Alan. So yeah, as you said, I'm, I'm a principal conservation scientist at the RSPB, so I work in RSPB's conservation science department. And my role is leading on our UK upland research. So that covers our research that we do in the hill and mountain areas of the UK. And it, it covers a range of work on priority bird species, including curlew. And then it also covers a range of the, the key upland land uses that we find in the UK. So for example, grazing, forestry, onshore wind farms. And, it, and the, the, the aim of the research program is try to understand uh, why some of our upland uh, birds are declining and how that links to land use and other factors and what, what kind of recovery measures we can put in place to try and uh, recover their numbers. Right, okay, so let's start by just setting the scene. Curlew, it's, it's a lovely big wader. A lot of people, even non-birders, will have seen it, even though they might not be able to put a name to it. Um, there are big numbers that winter here believe around about 150,000 and the breeding numbers I'm not going to quote because I think the numbers I may have might be slightly out of date so let uh, you tell us that so what are the breeding numbers currently in the UK? So the, the, the breeding population in the UK the estimate has re recently been updated and it, it tells us that we have about 58 and a half thousand breeding pairs across the UK most of those are in England and Scotland. So in Scotland, the estimate is around about 31,000 pairs. And in England, it's about 25,000. We have much smaller numbers in Wales and Northern Ireland. So probably less, less than 1,000 in Wales and around about 500 in Northern Ireland. Yeah, I know I was listening to Mary Colwell's podcast yesterday about the Irish population, which is crushed by around 80%. Uh, which is staggering. Um, so, you know, it looks like that this is not just a UK issue. Is this, as well as Ireland, is this an international issue or is it, you know, just confined to this region? No, it's it's very much, the, the problems that Curly face, it's definitely an international problem. Uh, the, they, the breeding range extends from Western Europe, so Ireland and the UK, all the way east across into Russia. But we know that in many of the countries where populations are monitored, curlew are showing big, showing big declines, and it really is a, a source of worry at the moment. And when I was reading through the papers you kindly sent me last night, um, it mentions that we have uh, internationally important numbers of breeding curlews. Can you just put that into context for us? Yeah, so the UK supports the third most important uh, population globally. So only Finland and Russia have bigger populations. So the, the problems that Curly face in the UK, could, you know, could actually have a direct impact on their global status. Yeah, right. OK, and um, just to sort of concentrate on the numbers again. So you mentioned sort of Wales and Northern Ireland and their, their numbers seem incredibly low. I'm, I'm a little bit surprised about that for Wales. I, I don't know Northern Ireland very well to, to bird in. Um, but Wales, you would have thought with the coasts they've got and, and some of the inland breeding areas that they, they were doing quite well there. Um, so is that not the case? Well, if it, we, the research tells us we, we don't see any major problems on, in the, during the winter. So, 
you know, the UK has wonderful estuaries and coastline and um, supports a big population that, as far as we can tell, is doing, doing pretty well in the winter. The, the problem is all in the breeding season. And yes, you're right. I mean, Wales, at, at face value, has lots of suitable, uh, you know, upland habitat. There's a lot of rough grassland, a lot of moorland. Unfortunately, you know, curly have declined massively in Wales. And there's probably a variety of factors that have caused that. It could be long-term changes in grazing pressure, making the habitat unsuitable. Uh, it's likely to be that the placement of uh, conifer forestry on some of their breeding areas as well. So, the, yes, there's a lot of what, more, what might look like suitable breeding habitat, but unfortunately it's just not supporting uh, big enough numbers. So can we just um, put a few figures on this? Well, when we're talking about this decline, what percentages are we, are we talking about in sort of the land? I know it's huge in, in Ireland, but, you know, in the likes of Scotland and, and, and England, which are the strongholds in the UK, what percentages are we actually looking at? Well, the overall UK population trend that from, uh, from you know, good quality BBS monitoring tells us that since 1995, we've lost nearly half of all the curlew that breed in the UK. And that rate varies across the different countries of the UK. So in, in England, uh, the decline is a bit less, is less than half, but in Scotland, it's more severe. So around 60% around decline since the mid 1990s. Yeah, and for those of you who don't know what BBS is, BBS is the Breeding Bird Survey. It's a citizen science project run by the British Trust for Ornithology. Um, you know, the, the numbers are you know, extremely accurate because they've got a lot of people on the ground volunteering and, and sort of undertaking that survey. So, um, you know, very accurate figures. So thanks for that. So clearly they're in trouble. There's a big issue around curlews. Um, what is actually driving that decline? What, what are the key factors that are influencing that drop? So the, the research that's been done has it all points towards problems in the breeding season. And the, the key factor is that curly simply aren't raising enough young to fledging to maintain their numbers. Right. So, so when you say yeah. they're not raising enough young, what what numbers would you be expecting to be raised? And what are the numbers? So, yeah, the, the research that was done suggests that each pair needs to raise one chick for fledging every other year. And that, that might not seem like a very high number, but unfortunately, many areas in the UK where productivity is being monitored suggest they, they consistently fail uh, to reach that value in, in many areas. See, see that, that's, that really puts it into context. I mean, you know, you, you can talk percentages, you can talk numbers, drops and all the rest of it. But if we're talking about in order for them to sustain their population, they only need to raise one chick every second year. And that's not actually happening. That is an incredibly worrying figure. It is. I mean, and you know, curly are long-lived birds, and so the problems might not become apparent at first because you know, if, if you're if you're simply monitoring their breeding numbers, you might see that the numbers that come back each year and try to breed don't change very much. But beneath that, you know, we know that they're actually just not raising enough young. So eventually. Um, if there's no young birds coming into the population, th those adults will get older and older and eventually they will be, they will start to be lost from those sites. And th this may put you on the spot. You, you, you may not know the answer. Um, at what number, there's a wry smile there, you maybe know what's coming, but at what number will the population become unsustainable? So where it is actually extremely difficult, if not impossible for it to recover? I mean, yes, yeah, so it's hard to put a figure on that. Um, I mean, the curlew is still a, a common and widespread bird. You know, the, the headline figure is that we've still got around 58,000 pairs. But the, the problem comes particularly as numbers get really low in different parts of the range. So, you know, the, the numbers, when, when they drop, uh, there just won't be enough adults coming back into certain breeding areas. And the curlew like to return to the areas they've always bred in in the past. So um, it means that you can get this gradual loss of range, particularly around the edges. And, and we're seeing that in parts of the south of England, where there's now very isolated pockets of just a few birds hanging on in different areas. And once they get to that level, it, it can be very hard to try and 
um, recover those areas? Yeah, I mean, the reason I asked the question is because a lot of people sort of watching uh, and a lot of people reading up on, you know, the decline of various birds will go, yeah, but they've dropped by this percentage, but there's still 68,000 or there's still, you know, whatever numbers there are. And they see that number and they think, oh, well, that's a big number. And they think, oh, well, you know, they're doing all right. There's a big number. Um, but clearly, you know, if, if something like the Eskimo kill you and also famously the passenger pigeon, which, you know, was one of the most numerous birds on earth, can go from being one of the most numerous on earth to disappearing completely. I think it's great to sort of give people an understanding that, look, you know, a, a number that might sound high isn't necessarily a number that will help sustain that population going forward, which is why I, I like to have that conversation. Does that make sense? It does. And I mean, I think that's why we're, we're so concerned. And, you know, there is, there is no room for complacency. You're, you're right. You've really, you really mentioned Eskimo curlew and Slenderville curlew. You know, if we were to go back 100 years, they were, they were two very common, very widespread birds. Um, you know, present, their numbers would have been hundreds of thousands, if not millions. But in a very short space of time, their populations just crashed and you know it's happened before so that's why you know we are worried about the curly you know we do need to act now yeah yeah too right so let's let's just talk a little bit more about um the course and um, you know you touched on it earlier when we were talking about whales what are the key causes of this decline so i think the fact that they're not raising enough young it really probably points to two key areas and the first one is the deterioration in their breeding habitats. So habitats might look superficially suitable, but um, they, you know, curly need uh, quite quite rough, damp habitat to breed in, and some of the agricultural changes that we've seen. So, for example, drainage and reseeding with um, fast-growing grasses can just reduce the suitability of the habitat in the first place. Um, but also, secondly, uh, curly are really um, impacted quite badly by predation during the breeding season. They nest on the ground, so their eggs are, are very vulnerable to predation. And also the chicks are uh, flightless for quite a long time. They don't fledge until they're around about 35, 40 days old. So they're very vulnerable for, you know, for, for many weeks. And this means that they, they do suffer quite high predation rates. Yeah, yeah. So predation and change of habitat are the yeah. two key things. What, what changes to the habitat are happening for the habitat to be changing? if that makes sense you, you know is it because is is it agricultural is it you know what actually is it so yeah it's, uh, i think a lot of it is driven by changes in agriculture so in some areas agricultural management has intensified so as, as i said the fields of quite nice rough uh, damp grass and will be drained and um, you lose so you lose that nice species rich sward that will provide good um, nesting cover for them and also good invertebrate food supply so that will have been reduced yeah and in, and in many areas uh, the habitat will simply have been lost for example re replacing their open ground with conifer plantations yeah yeah and and i i just have to add to that um because you know farmers do take a lot of bashing um, but I know from sort of, you know, where I work and, and people that I get involved with that, you know, there are a lot of farmers out there that really care and are doing sort of a lot to help conservation. So it's not all just the farmer's fault type of thing. Um, yeah. So and then you mentioned sort of conifer trees. So conifer trees planted presumably commercially for commercial plantations. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Particularly since um, the, the two the two world wars. It, there's been a big drive for the UK to be more self-sufficient in terms of the timber it produces. So in the last few decades, we've seen a lot of areas um, of moorland planted up with conifers. And so, you know, the, the, those moorland areas, they're not particularly product, productive in terms of agriculture. So it makes them quite attractive for large scale forestry. And uh, yeah, so it's, a, it's, you know, commercial timber production. It has definitely replaced a lot of suitable curly breeding habitat. And um, again, again, if this is an unfair question that you don't know the, the answer to, I apologise. Um, but what is the um, mitigation for that? It's difficult and it's really been, um, it's a really live topic in the UK at the moment. There's a, there's a fresh drive to increase the UK's woodland cover. 
so in Scotland, for example, the Scottish government has some quite ambitious targets to increase woodland. But and the key thing is to make sure that um, you know we recognise there's a you know there's a need to increase woodland cover, but the key thing is to ensure that those the plantations go in where we where we think they're going to have least impact on curlew. So you know we have we have a good idea in the UK of where curlew are distributed, and so you know by working with the forestry industry, we think we can that forestry can be delivered, but in a way that um, avoids the important curly breeding areas. Yeah. Now the picture's frozen at your end, but um, I think the audio still sounds fine. So I think we'll carry on because okay. given that it's, um, you know, you're up in Scotland, you know, it, it, maybe the, the signal's just dropped a bit and it might come back. So we'll, we'll carry on regardless. And um, the one thing that I want to touch on, we, we've talked about sort of causes and mitigation and the one thing that did strike me when I read one of your papers, which was hunting, the the curlew is hunted in France. Is that still the case? So there's actually a um, there's a moratorium in place, and so that means that um, the hunt the, the the hunting season was curtailed last year, and as far as we know, the moratorium remains in place. So we're, we're very much hoping that hunting won't start again in this August. Right. Okay. Um. Yeah. So a moratorium. So that started last year. But um, what I can't get my head around is, are France not part of you know a? I don't know whether to call it a committee or uh, that has signed up to not hunt curlews. Is is it's not not the case, and haven't they been signed up to that for some time? Yeah, you're right. So there, there are various international agreements in place and probably a key one when it comes to hunting a curly is the African Eurasian water bird agreement and so this is a international agreement that a lot of um, countries across Europe have, and further afield have signed up to and Fran France is a signatory to that and there's, a, there's an international action plan for curly which, which states that no hunting should take place in a range state until uh, an appropriate um, adaptive harvest management process is taking place, which is essentially a, a process which says, okay, you know, is there a is there a number of curlew that we can we can hunt which is sustainable? And as yet, you know, that, that process has started. We, we understand in France, but we have it hasn't been completed. So, um, you know, France is a signature to that, and no hunting should be taking place until that process has been done. And, and what impact does hunting in France have on UK birds? So we do have some evidence from ringing recoveries that birds which breed in the UK have been recovered in France um, in the either during you know migration or the wintering period. And the the evidence suggests that those birds which are recovered tend to come more from the sub, sub breed in the southern UK, and we, we know those are the most threatened populations in the UK. Yeah. So then, you know, there is there is concern that the most vulnerable breeding birds in the UK could be could be moving through France at a time when hunting could take place. Sure, sure. So let's talk about the project. So what is the project and what is the project about? So RFPB has really uh, you know taken the issue of curly decline very seriously and has invested heavily in the recovery programme which has been running since 2015. And the main element of that has been a large scale research project, which we call our Curlew Trial Management Project. And we, we know from previous research about the, the drivers of decline, as we talked about, it's um, lack of suitable breeding habitat and predation. And so the, the trial management project is de delivering management on site to try and improve the quality of habitats and reduce predation levels. And we're testing how curly respond to that package of management compared to sites which where we're not working in the same way. And it's, yeah, it's been running since 2015. We were just about to go into the last year uh, this summer when the, the coronavirus interrupted the work. But um, so we don't know whether the project will actually be able to restart again. But we've got a lot of data that we've collected since 2015. So we'll hope once we start the analysis, what we really want to find out is can this packet of package of management improve breeding success and does it have a chance of recovering curly numbers? Right, right. And is there, 
a few days ago, I talked to Jess from Project Godwit, who are doing head starting. Is there, um, will there come a time or have you already thought about it or you're already doing it? Uh, is there a head starting project uh, linked to this? It's not within the trial management project. Um, head, some head starting has, is being undertaken for Curlew in the UK. At the moment, that's mainly taking place um, in in the southern UK, where, where populations uh, we have some very isolated pockets of Curlew, and the aim is very much just to prevent local extinction. Yeah. The, the yeah. situation for Curlew is a little bit different to blacktail godwits because the Curlews still occur very widely across the UK. So. In, in most of their core range, so for example, in the uplands of England and Scotland, head, head starting wouldn't really be able to have a kind of impact at the, the scale of the population. And we think that the main thing that we need to be doing in those areas is still managing land in the right way to try and recover clearly. Yeah, yeah, right. OK. And um, how can people help? I mean, is there any sort of citizen science linked to this? I mean, obviously, you, you've mentioned uh, BBS. Um, but is, the, is there any citizen science? Is it a case of just, you know, raising funds? How can people help you with the project? So, the, I mean, there's various ways that people could help. And I mean, I, think, I guess the key thing is that these, these recovery projects do, do cost a lot of money. So, you know, people can help by supporting the work of the RSPB and other NGOs who are um, doing, involved in curly recovery work. We are hoping to start our sort of phase two of curly recovery work um, later this year, which will be moving from the research phase into the delivery phase. And so we'll be delivering management across a number of sites. So we're, we're hoping to bring in volunteers in those areas uh, to help with some of the management. So that might be some way, one way that people can help get involved. Um, and another way is simply by uh, contributing to surveys. So for example, the, the breeding bird survey, you know, a, a lot of our work on Curly relies on having accurate an accurate idea of how their numbers are changing. So contributing to those national surveys is also very really important. Right. OK, so you mentioned volunteers. Will, will that be something that's advertised on your website? How will people find out about that? I think it's probably going to take place um, at a sort of local level, um, depending on where the, the sites are that we're delivering the management. But it's I mean, when that when that recovery, the sort of the phase two project starts, it's something that definitely we will be talking about publicly. Right. OK, that's that's great. Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll close there. I think we've you know, given hopefully a very good background to um, number one, you know, the issues faced by the Curlew, and number two, uh, your project. I wish you every success with it. Um, I'll certainly be following it with interest and, you know, maybe we can talk again in you know, a few months time and, and just sort of see how it's progressing. I mean, I know it, it's a difficult time at the moment. So seeing a few months time, you might still be sat there in your flat in Scotland and, and not be, have been able to do much. But what we'll do is we'll, we'll sort of keep an eye on it and maybe talk in the future. So for now, David, thanks ever so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Alan. It's been, been a pleasure. So thank you. And I, I will hopefully speak to you again on a more positive note in the future. Look forward to it. Many thanks. Okay, Take thanks. care. Bye. Bye.